the showrunners and everyone involved with the new live-action Avatar The Last Airbender adaptation should honestly be quite thankful to M. Night Shyamalan and everyone involved in that disastrous attempt to adapt the show to the big screen back in 2010. That movie was bad, and it brought the ire of an entire large fandom down on it. It was a complete disgrace to a very thoughtful and contemplative and vivid show that ranks as one of the best shows, animated or otherwise, in the last 20 or so years. Compared to that disaster, the Netflix adaptation had a relatively easy job. All it had to do was not completely squander the potential of the show and show some modicum of faithfulness and care in adapting the show to live action and it would win the respect of a lot of fans. And I think honestly that is what has happened. The show has won the appreciation of a lot of people. The characters look like they are supposed to. The costumes look like they are supposed to. The locations look like they are supposed to. Everything fundamentally fulfills the requirements of authenticity that people want from an adaptation. Does that make the show good? That's a bit of a tougher question. I would say it's fine. It's adequate. I cannot say that I am particularly impressed. And I would like to calmly and civilly talk about why. So much in this new adaptation feels rather superficial. Art at its best really drills down into the deep cavernous emotions and psychological intricacies of people in a way that is clearer and sharper than ordinary mundane life allows. And that is true regardless of whether we're talking about a book written 500 years ago or a movie being made now, whether we're talking about a show that's set in a relatively realist world or one that's set in a fantastical world. The trappings matter, of course, but they matter in service to the fundamental artistic motives, which is to really demonstrate the longings and passions and laments of people and groups of people in a way that is poignant, is complex, has a sort of mature depth and breadth of understanding to it. The original show absolutely does. It absolutely succeeds in those regards. There are a lot of moments I think of quite often. I think of the storm and that virtuosic pairing of Zuko's story with that of Aang and how their character journeys are much more similar than they think, that they are matched not simply because they're both in pursuit of something, and not simply because, you know, one's the hero, one's the villain, or quote-unquote villain. And there's an obvious symmetry between, between uh, their practical journeys, their pursuits of their goals, but more than that because of this psychological similarity between the people, because Aang is consumed with anxiety and guilt about his running away from the monks, not because he needed to, but because simply 
He was scared. He was uncertain. He felt that he was going to be separated from Gyatso. Whereas Zuko, his story is not exactly the same, but it hits a lot of these same emotional beats. He also is gripped by this deep despair, this writhing sense of self-loathing. He has accepted the value system of his father, and as such he feels deeply ashamed that his father, whom he trusts, whom he truly believes in, whom he truly valorizes, and who stands as a symbol of a powerful and mighty country that Zuko also rejects, so that father has rejected him. They're both hiding from themselves. They're both constantly resisting from really reckoning with these more distraught, more uncertain sides of themselves. Despite the ostensible differences between them, there is at base this underlying similarity that links them together in a way that they are not necessarily aware of and thus adds context to their ongoing journeys and to the episode that immediately ensues in the Blue Spirit where they work together and work together well in pursuit of a common end. I think about that episode a lot. Not simply in regards to how much I love it, although I do love it, but in regards to this commonality in guilt, this commonality in anxiety that ultimately paralyzes one and prevents one from truly moving forward with life freely and without encumbrances. The Netflix show does not really capture this moment particularly well. It transports a lot of Aang's journey, what we only see in flashbacks in the storm, right to the start. And meanwhile, it tries to change his character a bit. In season one, in the original show, Aang's character is largely defined by his unwillingness to be the Avatar. He really wants to be this fun-loving kid who believes the best of everything. In the Netflix adaptation, he says that he is that, but he, the character is much more dour and a bit more downbeat. There are a few flickers of that Aang fun, but the tone of the show is much more melancholy and somber from the first episodes. And the change is felt even in something like Aang, in the original, completely refuses to believe that the airbenders are all dead. He still holds out hope because that's organically who he is as a person. He is one who loves to hope, who loves to believe in the best of situations. That's one thing he has in common with Katara. Whereas here, he believes instantly that the monks are dead, that everyone is dead. And so, the moment where he discovers Gyatso's skeleton does not really have the same impact in the Netflix live action. And also, since we don't learn a lot of Aang's backstory until later in the original, there is a sharpening of the parallel with Zuko. It's not just just that, it is deeply felt and deeply communicated. Whereas in the show, it's a bit more diffuse. The Zuko backstory is more or less saved until later. It's in episode 6 of the Netflix show, Masks, which is arguably the best episode of the show because it covers the Blue Spirit, and the Storm, 
two of the best episodes of the original season one, so it would have had to try hard to mess up such a solid foundation, and it doesn't. It doesn't mess it up. But it does not necessarily improve on what's already there, and that's a bit unfortunate, nor does it necessarily understand what's already there. Zuko is not immediately banished, it seems, in the Netflix show, nor does he completely refuse to fight his father like he does in the original. Instead, he tries to fight, and he has the chance to injure his father, and he refuses to take it. In that way, the Netflix show kind of blends together his fight with Ozai and his season one fight with Zhao, which is not in the Netflix show. Ozai then views his inaction as weakness, burns him, gives him another chance to repent, and demonstrate this true Fire Nation indomitable, ferocious strength, and when he refuses, only then does Ozai banish him. There's nothing wrong with this series of events, necessarily. There's nothing wrong with making additions, but doing so makes the show a bit more diffuse. It takes what's, in the original, a very concentrated and very dense and powerful moment and makes it a bit less deeply felt. And also, in the Netflix show, there's this weird implication that Ozai kind of expects him to come back eventually, that his banishment really is temporary. Whereas in the original show, it's pretty clear that Zuko is delusional, that his father has no intention of ever seeing him again, that the mission was simply an excuse for banishing Zuko because no one is ever going to complete it. A lot of things like that that are done very clearly and very sharply and luminously in the original are a bit more scattered here. I only focus so much on this one series of changes in the Storm Blue Spirit series of episodes because I think it illustrates where the show in live action falls a bit short. I definitely do not want a one-to-one -one adaptation. I don't think anyone really wants that. And I think there are a few moments where the show deviates from the original and improves on it. To some extent. For instance, I think the interactions between Sokka and his love Suki early in the second episode of the Netflix show are significantly better and more clearly communicated than what one has in the original. The two actually have this rather passionately felt chemistry, and it helps buoy that episode and really give it a coherent center. There are other elements of the show that are necessarily different, but not in a worse way. Dallas Lou gives a very good performance as Zuko, and the actors for Iroh and someone like Admiral Zhao are also quite well done. They perform admirably. Daniel Day Kim as Ozai gives a different performance than Mark Hamill in the original, but that's not necessarily a worse performance. His Ozai is less ferocious and more 
stern and disapproving, much more like Hiroshi Sato in Korra, also voiced by Daniel Day Kim. Elizabeth Yu as Azula does quite a good job, although I'm not really sure there was a need to introduce Azula in Season 1. And there are some weird things the show does that kind of work. They're crazy, but they kind of work. Like, the third episode and the fourth of the Netflix live-action adaptation take place in Omashu, but they kind of combine... The Omashu episode with Boomy, the Cave of Two Lovers episode from season two, the Jet episode, 110, and the Northern Air Temple episode, 117. It's completely bizarre, but it kind of works, I have to say. And... Paralleling how Sokka feels betrayed by the Mechanist and how Katara feels betrayed by Jet is really smart. I respect that, and it gives some tension between the two siblings. And yet, there are just so many little ways that the show is worse that it does not really seem to understand exactly why the original works so well. There are some things that are just kind of bad in an inexplicable way, like what they do with Roku. He becomes a joke, more or less. Kiyoshi is unusually stern, and her advice falls victim to the show's tendency to make every piece of dialogue as blunt as possible. The animated show, even though... It was directed at a younger audience, trusted its audience to understand things like subtlety and implication. The Netflix adaptation does not to the same extent. And that's a bit disappointing. One of my... quote-unquote favorite examples of such simplification is when they have Ozai straight up say that compassion is a weakness. And then Zuko says the same thing to Aang when he's recovering in the aftermath of the Blue Spirit shenanigans. It's not that Ozai doesn't believe that. He does, absolutely. That is true to his character. But that's just an unusually blunt and kind of reductive way to say it. These characters tend to talk in the most obvious, kind of flat way possible. There's not a lot of depth here. Everything is very superficial. And I, I don't mean superficial as a generic insult. I mean literally superficial, like everything is on the surface. You do not really have to do a lot of depth reading for the Netflix show. Everything is very clear, very overt to the point of being extremely obvious. Is that a problem? Sort of? It's not a problem in the same way that, say, Katara is a problem in the live action. I never thought I would say Katara is a problem. I love Katara. She is probably my second favorite character to Zuko in the original, and yet both the writing and the acting for this character are just bad. And that really disappoints me. Kyo and Tio, the actress, is not always horrible, but she really does not have the fire and the emotion and the energy to really bring to Katara. There's just this flatness and this uniformity to the character. She doesn't really emote. 
Sokka is clearly the older brother, the protector one of the group. Or Katara is the timid and restrained little sister. Which is absolutely not how it is in the original. Sokka likes to think of himself as the protector, the warrior, because he's the older one. But that's not really an accurate descriptor of their dynamic. Katara was the one protecting him. She was the strength keeping the family together. Sokka admits as much to Toph in a very revealing conversation in the Runaway episode, 307. Aside from Katara, most of the characters are fine. Ian Ousley as Sokka does quite a good job. I was constantly impressed. He brings the Sokka of the animated show to life. A bit of the uh, slapstick is inevitably toned down because it's live action, but the jokes, the arch remarks of Sokka are still there. The show's not bad, and if you are an Avatar fan, you will probably like it. It's nice to see something represented in live action like that. Something you love so much. But I don't think that this show is going to attract a lot of people who are not already fans of the original. I like a lot of the art direction, but the colors here are just so bland and so drab. Everything is dark and gloomy with a lot of blues and grays and blacks. There, there's not that vivacious, exuberant wonder and beauty and luscious magic of the landscapes that one gets in the original. And that's just another way in which this show just feels a little less special than the original. That's probably the best way I can describe it. It just does not feel special. It lacks the spirit, the verve, the intensity of the original. Everything is just a little more blunt, a little more obvious, a little more simplistic. It's the difference between a brilliant original song and a mediocre cover. All the parts are still there, more or less. And if you like the original, you'll like the cover. And there are even a few little intricacies that the cover adds that I appreciate. Like Zuko is exiled along with the 41st Division in this version, the division that he saves and defends during the War Council meeting when the general is trying to sacrifice them. That's a, that's a nice touch. I like that. There are a few things like that, but there are far too many moments that just feel a bit sloppy, a bit uninspired, a bit inert. It's Avatar, all right. All the parts are here. They're just not assembled with imagination. The people behind this project clearly care about Avatar. They clearly like Avatar a lot, just like me and just like y'all, but they don't entirely understand why it works. Anyway, thank you all for watching. If you liked what you saw today, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Donate to my Patreon if you can. If you want to see more videos like this before anyone else, adios, comrades.